live. Man, uh, haven't done uh, haven't done a breaking news podcast in a long time. We haven't had an emergency pod in, in quite a little bit. Welcome to uh, the emergency edition of the Bluminati podcast. I'm your host Nathan Bond. Join alongside me, Seth Barnador, as always, and we brought in Colin Sherwin uh, to discuss uh, some some breaking news here. USF head coach Jeff Scott has fired much maligned defensive coordinator Glenn Spencer after Tulane put up 501 yards of offense against this Bulls defense, and uh, there are some reports suggesting Glenn Spencer openly defying a, a directive by head coach Jeff Scott in blitzing and blitzing and, you know, pressing a little bit more yesterday, and it didn't work out. So here we are. Um, some would say a couple of weeks too late, but what must be done eventually must be done immediately, and here we are with a game left looking for a new defensive coordinator because Jeff Scott understands. Colin, take it away. I know you got some thoughts. Yeah. Um, I – to me, this is one of the 10 best things USF has done in the last five years. And it's just because it goes so against type. Um, the thing that USF has always done, and for the most part, I have always agreed with this policy, by the way, is Doug Willard famously said when Stan Heath was under the gun, when other coaches were under the gun, when Skip Holtz was under the gun, we evaluate coaches at the end of the season. And it was like department policy and it was like written on high end tablets and it just came down and it was delivered. And that was just sort of what was accepted. And I think from a, a not only an HR perspective, for, but from a moral perspective, I think for the most part, that's the right policy. You know, I, people are dunking on Glenn Spencer today. Um, he's a person. He has a family. Um, you know, I don't I'm not here for people to lose their jobs. I don't want to see people lose paychecks. But again, this is a job that is public facing. Don't get in this business if you can't handle the heat. I get that, too. The difference between the USF of five years ago and seven years ago and 10 years ago in the USF of now is that there was a problem and they dealt with it. And like you said, what must be done eventually should be done immediately. And the reason that that's different now than it was before is because with early signing day coming in three weeks, I believe a little less, you need to make clear to the kids that are going to be the future of your program. Who's going to be here. And you need to make clear to those kids as well that are kind of on the fence that might sign early, that might sign somewhere else, that are thinking, you know, that are going through their options. You need to make clear to them that what they saw on Saturday was not good enough. And that is just going to be the reality of this business when you don't have to sign the first week in February anymore and you have to start signing kids in December. It's better for the players. The early signing day is it's bad for coaches, but that's OK, because we should we should be in this for the players, especially because they're not getting paid, at least not directly anymore. Um, the fact that USF didn't try and spin it or, you know, whatever, and they just, you know, did what needed to be done and, and we're, I don't want to say cool or cold about it, but just sort of mad, very matter of fact, sent out a release, you know, Scott said some nice things about Glenn Spencer in a, in a release and did it and did it with one game to go so that you're trying to fire up your team and say, look, this isn't good enough. And what we have done so far isn't okay. And we got one game for our season and you send a message and you send a message to your fans that what isn't good enough, that this isn't good enough. I am over the moon. I'm not happy somebody got fired, but I'm over the moon about you, how USF handled this and more of this, please give me more of this. Give me more. Look, you're going to play with the big boys. This is what the big boys do. Todd Grantham got cut. What? Three weeks ago in the middle of the season after a couple bad performances. Very so. And by the way, watching the UF defense, and Seth, you can speak to this better than I can, but watching the UF defense and watching the USF defense rush three and drop eight on third and long and continually get dusted off the off the world because of a lack of aggression and being extremely predictable and not seeming to have guys that play very hard in spots and, you know, bad... <laughs> Bad everything, bad scheme, bad technique, bad everything. Just and, and doing something about it. I think this is fantastic. So, like, I and and if what we're hearing is true that that Jeff Scott just saw some of the same things that everybody with two eyes and a television and an ESPN Plus account saw, um, that's really to me that's a good thing, and and that gets me excited for the future of this program. Um, so, yeah, this is not a thing that USF would have done before. And I'm not happy that somebody lost their job, 
but I am happy about how USF handled it. And I, I am, again, I, these people saying fire Jeff Scott. If it was an option, which it's not, you shouldn't do it anyway because you're just throwing more chaos into a program that has had unrelenting chaos since Willie Taggart left. Um, no. So deal with what's here. Take the worst side of the ball. Understand that you hired a, hired a coach in the first place that had no head coaching experience, and these are some of the growing pains that, quite frankly, are just going to come with that. I'm, I'm fired up. I think it's a good thing. And you know what? The, the spread opened at 14 at Circa this morning. I thought that was about right. Now it's up to 18 and a half. That makes no damn sense to me, uh, unless Dylan Gabriel's playing. If Dylan Gabriel plays, then, all right, look, UF's, UCF's a lot better when Dylan Gabriel plays. But if Mikey Keene runs his ass out there, and we're getting 18 and a half, let's go, Bulls. Cover time, baby. We got this. We are covering this one. Let's go. Do we get, do we get a trophy for that? Do we get a trophy for the cover? Let's go. <laughs> Colin's fired up. And, and listen, there's something uh, that's a little bit more poignant now than – maybe what we took it as fate at face value this week when Jeff Scott said, you know, if we're improving in like, like we say we are, we should be able to win a game on the road and that we can't hide behind the fact that we're playing top 20 teams, the top five team in the nation. Maybe it was more of a subtle thing toward Glenn Spencer. Like, Hey man, you can't, you can't say, you know, well, coach, we're going up against the top five team in the country. What do you expect to happen? You went up against a one and nine two lane team, absolutely floundering, and still got your ass handed to you. I think that may, I think that quote and, the, and that sediment may carry a bit more meaning than previously thought uh, as as the week unraveled. Am I uh, am I far far fetched on that, or is it seem like a maybe a double meaning there? No, I think there's there is definitely was sending a message to the team through that is hey if we're you guys because I'm sure the team is saying the same thing that we're you know we're getting better we're getting better all right then let's go out and prove it um they did not uh that's an understatement uh on Saturday but um I, I I don't know if this move gets made you mentioned Nate like the possibility of like open defiance uh and some kind of insubordination almost um that you know, there are rumors that Jeff Scott wanted to play a certain way, and they were not calling the defense that way. That's how you get fired in the middle of a season, doing stuff like that. You're basically asking to get fired by doing that because you're telling you're basically telling the head coach you don't know what you're talking about. One, and that I don't have to listen to you. I'm just going to do my own thing. Those are two bad signals to send to your boss. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that was the intention to try to ride out through the season and, and that was the final straw. Um, but regardless, the performance has not been very good. I, I wonder what's interesting about the hire, the initial hire, and then kind of what you're seeing. And then I, I do think Eric has a good point of wanting a more experienced guy on that side of the ball with all the young assistants they had. If you go back and watch, FAU, when we back, went back and when the hire was initially made and we watched them and talked about them, they were aggressive. They went out and played SMU, played a ton of man coverage, really aggressive, and just totally detonated that really good SMU offense with Michelle and, and all those guys that had torn USF up that season. You did not ever see that in two seasons. You, you did not ever see aggressive man coverage really blitzing and doing all this creative stuff. It just It just never seemed to happen. I don't know what the reason was for that, but that could be part of it too, where Scott thought he was getting this really aggressive, um, you know, exotic looks and third downs, all these different things. And and then when it, then you just haven't seen that. So maybe it's just kind of part, I mean, that might be part of it too. Absolutely. It just, it, 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 it sucks for, to, I hate firing people. I, I'll be perfectly honest here. Uh, but oh, since I've taken over the blog, I've said three people need to be fired. And Why all three. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. We, had, <laughs> no, we, uh, we just let the contract expire. At, mm. Actually, they'd get it. Relieve us of that burden. But, you know, between Charlie Strong, Sterling Gilbert, and, and now Glenn Spencer, uh, the writings was on the wall, and if you keep Glenn Spencer on for next year, 
you're definitely in a Sterling Gilbert situation. You're definitely lining yourself up to be like Dan Mullen six six weeks into the year where, crap, may, maybe we should have pulled the trigger on a different defensive coordinator, and now you're both out of the job. I don't think Jeff Scott will get fired after next year unless they go 1-11 one in, one in or something like that, and it just is pure chaotic. But you were setting yourself up that, it could go that way. And it's smart as Colin, you mentioned they recognized it and did something about it sooner rather than later. And that's, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, perfectly Frank, uh, that is needed. And, uh, it, it's going to be an interesting way to fix what's happened. And I don't even know who the next guy up is. Uh, Jeff Scott's going to, going to announce on Tuesday at his press conference who's going to be you know taking over as the safeties coach who's going to be calling plays there's George Barlow's the only guy with experience calling plays uh some scuttlebutt about Ernie Sims it could be someone completely different I just I don't know who it could be uh right now and that's that's what happens when you have a young coaching staff and there's only one guy who has experience when you pull this trigger you gotta now you're just throwing someone into the fire who's maybe never even called a, a defensive play in, in high school as a coach or bring coming up at any point ever. It just kind of throwing them into the fire uh, against a rival is it's a, it's a big decision. So I, I can understand the hesitation uh, by USF, maybe what not wanting to, but having to do so. So let me, um, they know who's going to be, who's calling plays on Friday. They already know. They just haven't told us. Right. But they know. I mean, a hundred percent, you don't do this unless you already know. So like, okay. Um, the, the thing that I like though, is that even if you have somebody who's never called a play one, that makes you less predictable. And God knows that is something that USF defense desperately, desperately needs. And two, um, I would say that most of our coaches, I don't, I haven't seen any of our coaches that aren't are either have some sort of physical challenges and they also appear to have all four limbs so they can point on a play chart to blitz on third down. Okay. So they can actually like take the little piece of paper and they can go, we're going to blitz here. We like run this play, the blitz play on third down. And I think just that alone, even if it doesn't like, you're going to get beat. Like you, you blitz sometimes you're going to get beat. That's fine. But your players might be like, Hey, now we're going to do the thing that we've all been saying, because the players are thinking the same thing. The fans are thinking, which is the same thing that Jeff Scott was thinking. You know what I mean? Like it's likely because the, let's face it. These defensive backs aren't very good. This, this is a beat up unit. They can't cover very long, whatever it is. And especially if Dylan Gabriel plays USF's going to get, dusted deep a couple of times in this game they're gonna do that no matter who the hell the defensive coordinator was but maybe you give your chance your yourselves a chance to make a negative play or two and that might be enough you know what i mean i don't know how you can fix tackling in in 120 hours but you know what i mean like let's uh, just a different voice and the fact that they're they're acknowledging what we all know to be true that this game can save your season that what glenn spencer was doing was not good enough and that to your future recruits, what we have done is not good enough. Come here and help us fix it. These are things that USF has not done before. So to me, this is a really good moment for the program. Whatever happens on Friday, this is a really good moment for the program. Yeah. Uh, wanted to uh, just kind of discuss the, the season um, from the defensive standpoint. Uh, so they're allowing 36.27 points per game. Uh, not great. Uh, they're uh, allowing 7.1 yard, 7 yards per play. Um, so that, that's uh, an average of 489 yards per game. They've given up 5,382 yards of total offense on the season. That Hold is on, just Nate, a Nate, Nate, we are, we are an analytically driven blog. Raw yardage. Is not how we judge these things. Colin, you know I was mean? about to make a funny point and you just oh, sorry. That fuck it God, up. God, man. I was gonna make a, I was gonna make another joke about never mind. Go ahead. I screwed it up. My fault. <clears throat> Pretend that didn't happen, folks. Two, three, four. <laughs> All right, Vito, cut this. 
Is that how this, is that how this works, like? That good. is how this works. Well, at least the, the podcast will have this cleaned up, so the podcast <laughs> listener won't won't know that Colin rudely interrupted my joke. My uh, so, <clears throat> starting from here, Vito, uh, the Bulls defense has given up five thousand three hundred eighty-two yards, which is just a hair over three miles. Uh, 53 touchdowns. Um, they've uh, allowed their opponents to score 31 touchdowns and 47 red zone trips. They're allowing opposing def- uh, opposing offenses to convert on 63% of their fourth downs, um, in addition to uh, hair under 40% on third downs. But when you add in the 14 other conversions, it's hovering closer to 45, 50% of third and fourth down success rate for opponents. Just horrendous. Just so yards not play. Bad. I have a, I have a chart. It, it takes out all FCS games. Um, but in FCS or an FBS to FBS competition, only 130 teams, us have the 124th at 7.3 yards per play. The teams behind them, Charlotte, UMass, Duke, New Mexico state, Akron, and Kansas. Um, Kansas beat Texas. Kansas beat Remember? Texas, but Kansas, but Kansas earlier this year. Was just, <laughs> that's why Lance Leipold, Seth and I discussed on our other uh, event, is Lance Leipold should be a candidate for bigger jobs because that's how much Kansas has improved this year. Um, but they are, they are. An, it's not that they're bad; it's that they're an abomination. And it, you know, it's one thing if you're giving up 490 some yards to Cincinnati. It's one thing if you're giving up 490 yards to SMU. You shouldn't be, but like, okay, if you're giving up 490 some yards to Tulane. Who's not exactly out there, like, you know, going blur Oregon fast and eh, it's kind of meh. That's just like completely unacceptable. And a, so, and a two lane team that took its foot off the gas in the second half. Oh, absolutely. We, everybody, everybody knew. Everybody knew Tulane was going to park the bus and they did. And, you know, I sent out a tweet, I think, midway through the third quarter with, you know, pretending to be, uh, you know, someone from USF, maybe Coach Scott saying this, but I think he was smart enough not to say it yesterday. I was like, hey, we only held them to 10 points in the second half, and that's exactly how many points they held them to because they, they took their foot off the cast. They knew that they had this win comfortable, and they're, you know, they, they did break out one trick play that seems um, silly to do when you're up so much, but hey. Smoke them if you got them, and, and Tulane smoked them and, and smoked them good. Uh, yeah, you gotta gotta go out with a bang. You gotta get them all out on scene. <laughs> and uh, it, we discussed uh, in the post game show uh, yesterday with Seth uh, that uh, East Carolina in the torrential downpour, five point four eight yards per play given up defensively would have ranked sixtieth in the country. Your, Your best, best per. Performance, best performance of the year. You give up almost 500 yards in a uh, trench down four, and that your best would be about average. And guess what? They were not near that number very often. Now, to be so, fair to Glenn Spencer, the personnel is not great. I got injuries; they don't look great. But like, there's bad, and then there's this. And this is a whole other level of bad. Like, yeah, and and we we've, we've talked about that. Uh, throughout the year but the other side of that argument is and we brought it up is, and we talked about it yesterday navy like a navy an army they have fielded effective defenses with not anywhere near i think the raw talent and personnel that you have there's not guys aren't transferring i don't you guys i don't know how close you watch the transfer portal you don't see a lot of university of miami to the army or to the Naval Academy. You don't see a lot of those transfers, right? So there's definitely more raw talent here at USF than there are there, and they're able to field pretty good defenses. So there's no reason USF cannot field a average defense. There's there's really no reason for that. Literally zero reason. Let's just go over the yardage numbers so we can cry uh, because it's fun. 501 yards yesterday. 506 to uh, Cincinnati, 646 to Houston. In a torrential downpour at East Carolina, you give up nearly 500 yards. And then Temple, you only give up 231. 
but that was in 15 minutes of offensive action for Temple with a quarterback who's no longer with the program, a wide receiver who's no longer with the program. You gave up six, six and a, over six and a half yards per play against a team literally imploding. Yeah, at halftime leads in four games and for, spanning from uh, October 16th to November 6th, and you you win one of them because your defense can't stop a nosebleed, uh, and this is the result. And it it's it was just so needed, and uh, I'm just glad it happened. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest in this. Like this was this was overdue, probably after seeing how FAMU kind of moved the ball pretty well. Like there were there were signs early in the season that this was not going to be a good defense, and uh, <clears throat> boy, how did they prove this right? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and look, I, but, and credit USF for being proactive here. Um, I, I, this is great. You know, uh, I hope these kids are fired up. Um, I hope they are ready to go play in Oviedo and leave it out on the field. Um, you know, it's never the player's fault. That's just how college football works. It is never the player's fault. And so they got to – I hope they see this. I hope they're as excited as we are. You can see flashes on this team, I mean, especially on offense. But you see flashes on this team where you go, they got some they got some dudes, you know? <laughs> like if, if – McLean made some mistakes, mistakes yesterday, but like that's a dude. You know what I mean? Like you can see Brian Batie is a dude. You know, you've got some pieces that you can build around. You've got the portal coming. This there is no reason this team can't get to a bowl next year with a plug and play with the right pieces and a new coordinator and a new system. So you want to build some momentum, play well in Oviedo on Friday. And um, yeah. All right. So guys, you you're a little more plugged in than I am. Uh, I've only had one name floated at me so far. And as I know it's a name you've both had floated at you so far. Who um who do you think USF goes out and acquires in the coaching transfer portal? Um, do you have some names out there that you think would be a good fit for USF after um, whatever happens on Friday? I, I, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. Kind of, yeah, what, where's the hire coming from? That's kind of my biggest question. What are the, you know, what is behind the hire? Is it uh, you want a guy that has play calling experience? Well, how, you know, how much does that limit your, or you want a guy that's a play caller currently, how does that limit your candidate pool? Like, are you going to be able, it's not like, I don't think you're going to be able to go hire a power five defensive coordinator. Are you going to be able to attract a G, another G five defense coordinator? I don't know. I think the money is pretty good. They, I think they were playing, they were paying Spencer like $500,000, I believe. That's and what's his, good. what's his buyout by the way? Cause is, is it one of these 20 week buyouts or is it like, Yep. It's all of it. It, it's well, I mean, per the per the contract, it's per the contract given to us unless there's something with the foundation like with every other coach. Um it's twenty Which, by the way, I was told ten, I was told seven years ago that we'll never do that again. But go ahead, go ahead, continue. <laughs> um, <laughs> Even though it keeps happening. So it's his uh salary was five hundred thousand with a six thousand dollar monthly stipend stipend for, for a car. <laughs> Six thousand dollars. Like, what are you buying? What are you buying for six thousand dollars? A Lambo. Spencer got a Lambo fetish. Genie need a Lambo. From what I, mean, I saw, Rolls Royce. Loves, from, from what I saw, he loves long drives. <laughs> <Ooh! laughs> yeah. So. <clears throat> oh mercy! Mm. I wonder if that six K included like. Oh, you're recruiting gas. Like, you had to pay for the gas to go, like, get recruits. You know what I mean? Did, well, that, I mean, wouldn't that mean that you would have to have an effect on the recruiting trail? It's better than the old athletic director. He used to put in for mileage to go to Lenny Subs across the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. That happened. <laughs> that's a far <laughs> drive, man. Take what they give you. So, so, that's a so I think the, that's the biggest question it, for me. Is it going to be uh somebody with play calling experience if so it, do you think they can attract those guys from the the same level or do, are you gonna have to look for uh fcs coordinators or is you gonna go hire an assistant at a big program scott shown the propensity to go back to his roots and certain he's hired um after kind of branching out in these first hires um, the the guys he brought in the offensive side of the ball came making a guy that was with him at Clemson 
Bobby Bentley, a guy that he coached for at Presbyterian, I believe. So, you know, is, does he go back to uh, those roots? Does he try to hire a Clemson assistant away to be the coordinator, a guy that maybe is called, uh, you know, maybe never called plays? You know, I, I'm not quite sure. And that's where, you, you know, you with him being kind of in a, a limited tree. Uh, um. <clears throat> Is oh the Nate internet kicks in oh, oh no. no the eight the, it we're at we're only in minute uh, twenty five and the Nate net already has uh has crashed the podcast yet again uh I, this is me stretching and filling until Nate gets back online it sounded Nate, like he us, had something really good to say too that's, that's I know he was he he got the um in there and usually from Nate that means like we're gonna get like some piece of doubt oh we've lost Nate It'll all right. Back. He will be. So, Seth, um, let's go ahead and uh, you know the coaching world way better than I do. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have specific names out there. I'm going to give you one that's certainly um, – I'm not saying anything here that hasn't been said on Twitter. So, um, mm -hmm. Danny Verpale, who is the uh, D.C. and safeties coach, the exact same position Glenn Spencer had at USF, um, at well, Kennesaw State, um, plank, the, the team with the plank in uh, suburban Atlanta that has been – doing really well at FCS. Um, they won again yesterday. Um, I I remember Danny as a player. I remember um, <laughs> when I lived in Vegas like 12 years ago, He we randomly hung out one afternoon um, with some old USF friends and uh, seemed like a super sharp kid. Um, I I think he'd be a fit. I, I don't know if he's ready to be a coordinator at the FBS level, but everything that you know I know is that this kid is like really – an, an up and comer in the business and maybe yeah maybe he's somebody you take a flyer with here even in a coordinator role i've coached with i coached with some guys at tusculum that coached with him uh previously and then uh they coached with him after at valdosta i believe and they all had good stuff to say about him said he's a really sharp guy um that he would do really well i think when he's going to kennesaw state um there kennesaw state is 16th in sp plus in fcs defense so one of the better defenses in the country. Um, and they, they're they doing really well in, in most statistical categories defensively. So, I mean, it'd definitely be a guy. You want a guy that comes in, a young guy that's, like you said, pretty sharp, that's got a passion for the university and would probably be really good in recruiting because of that. You know, and, and I think he's willing. You know, the thing a lot of people said with Mullen, I, I wonder if people view Scott the same way when Mullen was looking for defensive coordinators, how many guys want to hitch their wagon to a guy that could get fired next year? And, and that was certainly a situation for Charlie Strong, and that certainly yeah. was a situation that's been a multiple situation at USF for many. So years. is that something he'd be willing to do? It seems like he would be a guy that would be willing to come back here to do that, even under the circumstances um, so I, I think that would probably be in his favor in, in addition to being, him being a good coach from everything I've heard. So I, I, you give him a multi-year deal is what you do. You say, all right, look, yeah. you, you're here for two or three, um, yeah. you know, whether the new coach retains you or not, that's on us. You were going to pay you. Other side yeah. of that is he coached under Kerwin. So maybe he saw what happened with Kerwin. Then maybe that kind of puts a sour taste in your mouth a little bit. Or, you know, you well, take that chance and sometimes it sets you back for a little bit. But uh, he's a young guy that I think might be willing to take that risk. Yeah, I mean, it's he's certainly got a bright future in front of him. And, and even if it didn't work out here, I think, you know, it seems like he's the kind of guy who's going to be able to find employment pretty quickly um, with yes. the success that he's already had. So, um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's... Other guys, I don't I don't know. Um, just looking, kind of looking around and seeing who's doing well in defense. FAMU is, uh, like, one of the tops in yards per play defense at the FCF level. Do they have a guy, you know, they're in Florida? I don't know. Let's see, Nathan, if he's back in. Are you back, Nathan? Can you guys hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Can't see you. Well, I, I figured if I just don't have my face on, maybe my dial-up will work. I, what's incredible is I'm the only one home, and the Wi-Fi wow. still sucks. That's that's you need a you but, need a repeater I, or or a, a plug-in somewhere, buddy. Yeah, I, I'm literally hardwired into my my laptop oh my from God. my internet. Oh my God! I know. I don't know what's going on. The man is trying to keep you down. They don't want this. It, they really don't want this hot user. content. Well, I was gonna five G phone with a hotspot, buddy. <laughs> Get the <new> right. <laughs> I may have to. I may have to. Uh, is Brett Brent Venables available? 
No, uh, <laughs> they're paying so the they, university. Yeah, maybe they paid Spencer five hundred. He's making two point five million right now. Um, you know, what, what are, are you we think? getting questions? By I saw we have a bunch of people watching. Do we? Have, do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, internal uh, promotion. Eric, I don't see it. I think. Um, I, I think that's that's fair. And Eric, that's really why I went down the rabbit hole of checking out the the Clemson tree. I just don't see. I don't see it. They've had Mickey Kahn. Uh, he's been the safeties coach since 2017. Um, I mean, so he's he's been a position coach for a few years. Um, but is this the is this uh, Mike, the move? Mike Reed is a guy that's uh, been at. Seems he's been at Clemson for a while as a corners coach. Eight years on staff. Um, yeah, I, I think you definitely could go there trying to see guys that he's been with at Clemson. That's kind of Todd, his MO. Todd Bates, defensive uh tackles coach, he's been a defensive line coach at Clemson since 2017. And he is like and, a top 10 recruiter, I believe. Yeah, he's also the recruiting coordinator. Um, yeah, I, I doubt that he would get out. I think they'd probably because I think he is their best recruiter on staff, like he's top five nationally, I believe, in terms of recruiting. So um, probably probably a downgrade in position if we're being honest. Um, but a pretty neat note on him between his tenure at uh, JSU in Clemson, every primary starter under his tutelage has earned at least one All Conference selection. Yeah, they're pretty. So <laughs> that's a pretty good. Point. Uh, he is he's pretty uh, pretty good at, at the coaching thing. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, Mike Reed as well uh, could be a could be a uh, he, he could be an opportunity. Uh, he could maybe be a guy looking at. I, I don't know. It's just that 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 kind of gets tough. Um, you know, I, we might have a better idea of what they have. Kind of, if you go back and look at maybe some guys they've had previously as uh, GAs that have gone on to other jobs. Um, you know, stuff like that might be a good spot to look for. Um, but I would think he wants somebody that's called plays before. Yeah. For sure. How about yeah. the next the next Jimmy Lake? How about Jimmy Lake? Eh, <laughs> how about no? And no. That's not there there were some things off the field at Washington that were not good. Like it, it, you think it was bad in front of the cameras, behind it apparently. It My was question is, way how, worse. then why is he not fired with cause? Um, because there is now a backlash to the fired with cause thing in college sports, and that coach there is a perception, and especially because remember the the Washington AD has been there like twenty some years. Yeah. Um, and there is a and she knew Jimmy Lake from, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there is apparently a perception now that if you're the school that fires the guy for cause and then tries to go and reclaim the contract, that you'll have a tough time hiring a reach candidate in the future. And so teams are are just feeling like, could they go after cause? Could have USF gone after cause for Charlie Strong for, you know, telling, uh, setting up some kind or being aware at least of some kind of system where when the compliance officers walk out to the practice field, we're all signaling to each other to get the coaches off the field. Um, yeah, you could probably go after and reclaim some of Charlie Strong's money, but does that actually hurt your program more in the long run? Because all Charlie was doing was, I mean, coach speak, trying to win mm -hmm. and it actually hurts you in the long run. So that is a an entire philosophy at this point. I don't, I'm not okay. going to argue for the morality yeah because i saw all the happened. all the issues and then you see that they're giving them the full buyout i'm like well then what what was the issue yeah or, or these right. issues must not have been that bad if you're giving the guy the full buyout but okay that makes a little more sense then yeah um so yeah do we have, do we have more questions because i have literally i do not know who usf could get as a coach the only name that's been thrown at me so far is dandy Burpale, and i that certainly makes sense to me um you know guy coming home but otherwise i am not nearly plugged in well enough to know who to go where to it's go. trying to figure out who who's an actual candidate right like who i think clearly the clemson route is tried and true for jeff scott but you know brent's been there for how long like how many do you know of any other clemson coaching tree coordinators 
or staffers who have left Clemson and have gone to uh, like another place. Like that seems like Clemson seems like the place where you stay for years until you get a better gig, head coaching job, what have you. I mean, I Jeff Scott was there for what twelve years before. Yeah. Before anything, Tony, Tony Elliott's still there. Tony Elliott's still there. Brent, I don't think he'll ever leave. Like, and I'm sure he's been tried. It's probably why he gets two point five million dollars a year is because he's one. He's good, and it's a good way to keep the your guy on staff. Because uh, as Clemson's kind of found out, when you re- remove a guy like Jeff Scott from your your coaching staff, it, it can take a little bit to kind of reset and recalibrate and get everything right. So I I just don't know where they pull from. They're not getting any, maybe a power five, you know, fired guy or, you know, someone trying to rebuild, reclaim some of their uh, cachet. And, you know, Todd Grantham, it's, Local guy, he you know, he's pretty pretty nearby. <laughs> unless he's stop. gone. Stop it! I, I I did that on Twitter and I felt guilty about it before I even finished the tweet. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't do it. USF fans are far too scarred. Like we can have fun and we can make jokes and and we can have people making these. Uh, we can have our, our friend Chris up in Seattle making these amazing T-shirts that I hope he is able to figure out a way to pull off. Um, but like you can't do that to people. That's just cruel. It's cruel. Well, so you guys were upset that Glenn wasn't blitzing, so now go to the literal opposite end of the spectrum and have Todd. Yeah, but Todd doesn't blitz on third down anyway. Todd, Todd, Todd plays, blitz, blitz. Todd blitzes Todd, until he stops blitzing on third down. <laughs> Todd plays cover too. A lot of it. A lot, a lot of cover. Of it. Yeah. I had a coach that uh, I had come on and talk about the defense coordinator. He said Todd Grantham has a thousand ways to get to cover two. <laughs> but it's just he it just gets all he does is he ends up getting the cover too. How about here's here's the name I'll throw out there. Uh, if you're looking for an older guy, maybe he's a guy that's been highly paid in the past, but he was the defensive coordinator for Chad Morris, who I think um I think Jeff Scott has a good amount of respect for. Uh how about John Chavis. Hmm. Name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah. Uh, he was the Arkansas D coordinator. He was at one point, I think it was a million dollar defensive coordinator, but uh, has not coached since 2018, 2019 at Arkansas. Strike. And he's 65. I'm out. For those reasons, I'm out. Then I don't know. I, so I'm trying to kind of find guys that have worked with people he knows. The the tree, like since they kept so many guys on, the tree is small. There's not a ton of shade underneath that coaching tree. It's right. kind of, you know. So there's not been yeah, Gary Patterson. Come on down, Seth. You got a you got a high school guy in Florida that just and, and maybe not as coordinator, maybe just to fill in on staff. Do you have a guy? where you go okay this guy is the next up and coming has been a successful high school coach yeah the Could guy the guy jump. i mentioned the guy i mentioned for the thousand ways to run cover too he's a really really good young coach he's the defensive coordinator at um union county they're undefeated in the playoffs right now what Making level their, uh they're smaller school but it's a traditional power he's coached at trinity catholic he's coached a few different places he's a young guy i think he'll make his way up the ranks but um you know I don't. I'm sure he would take a job if offered, but he's. I I don't know if you go to the high school rank. If you're going to that level, if you're going to the high school ranks, you probably go get a guy. Um, don't they have a guy on staff that was like the defense coordinator at Lakeland? Um, I gotta look. Oh yeah, uh, Will Is it recruiting. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, no, Will I, wouldn't Baylor. Be, I wouldn't be surprised if they put him, move him in to an on-field position. I mean, that, if you like, I think if you're, if it's typically if you're, if you're hiring right from the high school level, um, you're going to hire a guy then a, with a ton of recruits kind of in the, you know, a kind of um, hip pocket. Typically, yeah, t- typically a talent, really talent rich um, program. Clint, Clint Spencer still listed on the USF website right now, by the way. Um, so the. He's, he's, the entire season he's been listed as the linebackers coach. He's been the safeties coach for like 19 months. Oh man, go Bulls. Um, so the, 
yeah, I, I would say if you if you're gonna get a, a high school guy, you gotta get a don't you have to get a high school guy from like I don't know, a popka or IMG or, or, or IMG or yeah. like I'm, you know, can we get somebody from from a program like that that's bringing three kids with them? Here's so, another here's another here's another name under the Chad Morris tree. Was Chad Moore's SMU, uh, DC at SMU, Van Malone, currently assistant head coach, passing game coordinator, and cornerbacks coach at Kansas State. And who has been good this year? Um, good on defense. Can't, Van Malone. Pass, passing game coordinator, though. Are we corners for defensive passing game? Defensive passing oh. game coordinator. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Corners Hold on. coach. His name is – check out his name. Uh, he played safety with uh, in the NFL with the Detroit Lions. Uh, uh, his, four years, His yeah. full name is Van Buren Malone. Hmm. Van Interesting. Buren Boy. Knows this uh, – uh, coached at SMU previously, and Tulsa would ha- know a little something about this league. Um, has been at Kansas State since 2019. Looks yeah. like he, he's an older guy now, 51. He, uh, he coached with Glenn Spencer for two years. At Oklahoma doesn't look State. Fi- doesn't look fifty one. Looks like a looks like a spry young man. So and, that could uh, be uh well 2013, 2014 were Oklahoma State's best years on defense, and then it fell off, and that's why Glenn got fired in twenty seventeen and then bounced around um the last three so years. So did he leave to the is that <laughs> when he left to take the job at SMU? Yep, he took the job at SMU after twenty the twenty fourteen season. <laughs> I mean, there you go. I think it cracked the code here. No, but I, like I think it might be a guy like that, somebody that's coached with somebody that he's coached with in the past. Um, so it, it, that that would be an interesting name. But I, those, I think, those are the kind of names that you're going to see. Um, it would certainly, if going just going off of what he's done previously, it's going to be somebody he has relationship with. I think especially after going out and hiring guys he didn't know initially. Like, he did not have yeah. pre-existing relationships with Charlie Weiss or Glenn Spencer. He just kind of saw, I think, their geographic location and their performance they had and thought, you know what? These guys know how to recruit the area already. They're doing well. Go get them. So, so let me ask you, when you're putting together a staff, um, I've heard you want to have – you want to bring some of your friends. And you also mm-hmm. want to bring some guys you don't know, and you need a balance of both. Is yeah. that? Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't. To me, it's always helpful if you have people that understand kind of the program already, that have an idea of what the expectations are, all that kind of stuff. But you know, like way back in the day, you hear a guy like uh, I think one of Bear Bryant's famous sayings was like, "I want to hire people that are smarter than me." Like, so uh, sometimes keeping the same people around, it, it gets a little old. I mean, you're seeing this. I, I think Jeff Scott can take a lot of good lessons from what happened of 75 to Dan Mullen. Dan Mullen's a guy who kept the same assistants <laughs> around for 20 years, even when they were kind of failing. Um, very loyal to a fault. Kept his defensive coordinator around. I think he learned that lesson. He kept his defensive coordinator around a year too long. I think Jeff Scott saw that. What happened today was like, you know what? Let's not make that mistake, right? Um, but you know, so there's there's something to having familiarity. But to me, I think especially at this level, you got to go get the the highest achiever that fits exactly. If you need, you know, you need recruiting, you need you don't have to like you don't have to have. I think coordinators don't have to be dynamic recruiters. Those guys got to be excellent schemers. They got to be the scheme guys. Everybody else can be recruiting guys. If you find a guy that can do both. That's a positive, but um, I think you've got to get a guy that understands scheme very well and can adapt it to a variety of personnel. You don't want to hire a guy that can only because then when the defense doesn't look good next year, well, he doesn't have his guys in here yet. You don't have time to, for everyone to get their guys in. You got to have a guy that can go right now. So I think uh, finding a guy that's just really, really high level schemer is going to be the number one thing. And then recruiting and stuff like that, you've got a bunch of young guys on staff that can help there. But I am, I am so with you, especially at this level of college football, because you only can, you know, if you're at Georgia, you can say, we'll take that five star because he fits what we want to do better than this five star. You mm-hmm. don't have those options here. You're taking the best kids that are available and you need to build around them. And so that I, I, 
you know, look what happened when Sterling Gilbert was trying to plug, you know, running quarterback or, uh, you know, pocket passers, you know, Blake Barnett into a run heavy split zone system. I mean, that's stupid. You know what I mean? And we were doing it anyway. Cause we, they, he's like, I got the system. I know it works and we're going to grind out 3.1 yards per play because I know that, you know, in the long run, it's going to, that's just not what you, that's not how coaching and especially in the era of the portal where when the kid isn't playing, when you, he's going to transfer, you know what I mean? You're going to lose kids more than ever that, that you're going to have to rebuild your roster almost year by year now. You know what I mean? You're not going to get, what are you going to get? Maybe if you're lucky, 40% of the kids that you sign early on in a, in a few weeks, 40% of them are going to play four to five years here. And the rest are going to transfer. Or they're going to fall off or something's going to happen or, you know what I mean? That so you have to be able to build around the players that you have. So I completely agree with you. Um, and if, and if recruiting is less important because they have a young staff that can go out and get kids all the better, you know what I mean? But yeah, it, this is, Watching watching coordinators try and plug a square peg into the round hole that is U- USF football has been the bane of my existence my entire adult life. And I'm slamming on the table because I'm so frustrated at watching Todd Fitch throw goddamn fades in the corner of the end zone. <laughs> and I'm done with it. And so <laughs> we're no more. I, I, and you know what? When they do scheme it up and they do do it right, you saw what Tom Allen did with that defense the, the one year he was here. Uh, you saw what Wally B did. Now he started to build out a system at that point, and and he was, he had a four three system where, you know, they linked heavily in what they call a triangle read, and and they played a lot of cover too. Um, but that was, he had a system and a format that was here. But it, the guys that have been successful, you know, when when Rod Smith finally figured out like, hey, I I can move these pieces around a little bit and with a little more freedom, then you get games like the Amari Jackson games. So like I've seen. I've seen it what happens when it works, and I've seen what happens when it doesn't work. And it's the people who try and come in here and say, with all due respect to the current offensive coordinator's father, if you think you have a decided schematic advantage and that you can stuff your system in and start beating people, that ain't going to fly here. I think you're uh, you're right there. And uh, uh, Connor Farrell asked a, a pretty uh, good question. I just kind of looked, looked it up, see what uh, Brian – John Marie is doing. He is mm. he had, he had some he he spent uh the the 2020 season at Michigan as a linebackers coach and then headed to Tennessee to be their linebackers coach and yeah, Tennessee's been they're pretty really good. They're pretty good. Uh they're good. two two of his linebackers, uh Jeremy Banks, uh he leads the team with 96 tackles. He's got 9 tackles for loss, four and a half sacks. And then Aaron Beasley is third on the team with 69 tackles, four and a half tackles for loss, and a uh, uh, sack and a half. Uh, they forced some turnovers, a couple of QB hits, uh, some forced fumbles. Seth and I have been picking I, Tennessee a lot in our picks contest this year, so we we are familiar with the Vols. It's mostly been because of Hendon Hooker on the offensive side. But yeah. like, we have Deep we have is done better well. Than with, you think? Yeah, they are. They're they're really a, I, look. Everybody can make fun of plate, plate of donuts, but look, plate of donuts had a really good first year up there, and it seems like he's getting kids too, so they're going to be okay. And, and my question I is, really like BJ. Was, was he not basically yeah. fired though by Jeff Scott? They all, well, I mean, they, they they all were. I mean, it wasn't really fired. It was just sort of like, hey, I'm I'm going to bring my own guys. Yeah, I yeah mean, that's not really. Hey, you have a fired. contract. I'm not retaining you. Hey, I'm going to pay you to not be here. I mean, there's two ways to look at this. <laughs> well, that's it. Would you say? Would you say they fired Glenn Spencer because they're paying him not to be there? No, they no, they fired Penn, Glenn Spencer because there was a release saying that he was fired. Yeah. That's different. But all parted the, ways. But the, yeah. Parted ways. But like the yeah. nine guys that that Jeff Scott inherited. No, but they, I mean, he, still, he didn't think you didn't think enough of me to keep me around when you first came in, and now now you come crawling back. <laughs> they always yeah. come crawling back to Coach BJM. Maybe they had a nice meeting when they separated, and, you know, and, and, and Jeff said, look, I'm going to go with a different guy, but I respect you, you know, blah, blah, blah. I wish you the best of luck, you know, um, need some help carrying your boxes to your car, like whatever, you know what I mean? And then me, I, I we're projecting here. We have no idea, but like, no. there, I, I would say that I would be surprised if any assistant coach that was let go in the situation that 
that that Brian Jean Marie was let go in. That's what would you know what I mean? Would be like, oh well, screw this guy. He didn't keep me. Well, he didn't keep anybody. So now, <clears throat> you know, BJM's four two five defense was pretty good. For need five DBs, put five DBs on the field for us. Ever that would be even worse than putting four DBs. <laughs> they, they have five on the field. That's what the uh, <laughs> uh, the issue. My 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 issue within the last year, I think everyone talks about the pass defense. People ran the ball down their throat that last season. Yeah. They they gave up over two hundred yards rushing a game. Their passing defense was so good because people only threw the ball. I went back and looked at it. People only threw the ball fifteen times a game because they didn't have to throw the ball. And by the way, the linebackers coach at Tennessee definitely makes more than the defensive coordinator at USF, right? I don't know. See, um, when I was talking to that other coach about Florida's defensive coordinator position, Glenn Schumann is Georgia's inside linebackers coach and co-defensive coordinator. He makes 600 So They are uh, paying Glenn Spencer 500 I think. Mm-hmm. Checking it right now. So 500 a year. Could be. Could be close, but uh, Tennessee on Monday released the memorandum of understanding for Hypel's offensive staff hires, and those assistants will combine for two point five five million in salary for twenty twenty one. So it's five hundred grand a year for five assistants. Um, although, if eh, I guess, yeah, because they're all the offensive guys. So it was um, O line coach, offensive coordinator was making seven fifty, O line was seven fifty, running backs four hundred. Quarterbacks 350, wide receivers 300, increasing to 425, and with a and a retention bonus. Um, that was for the offensive side of the ball, guys. So USF was paying Spencer 500. Yeah, that's yeah, I believe so. So yeah, maybe there is some maybe there is some room to get like a a position coach from a, a high major SEC type school. Maybe there is the money to make that happen. Do you think because you a, would think a position a position coach would want to move up and and show that he can call plays for himself. Do you think it's a requirement that this guy have play calling experience? That is probably a question that I cannot answer. I That's right. I think enough. I'd like to hear Tuesday if, if when he talks about the vacancy, that would be because yeah. that that would cut your candidate pool down quite a bit if you're sure. only looking for guys that have called plays before. Um, I don't think. Right, we're not thinking. I think we might even already go. We're not. We're not thinking of an internal promotion, right? I don't mm. think any position. No, is, it's not like one position group is shining while the other, while while the others bring the town. It's it's been a pretty no. now. Obviously, there's is that because of the plays that are being called, possibly. But I think it'd be a hard sell uh, in terms of momentum and uh, excitement than uh, to just promote somebody from a defense that's given up. Yeah been one of the worst in the country the last two seasons. And I think in college football, especially today, I think you kind of need a defensive coordinator who's mm, crazy would be the nice way to put it. I don't think, I don't think the soft guys work anymore. I, like Dave Aranda. Yeah, you can, you've got to be, if Bring you him are, in. <laughs> we'll take days. <laughs> Bring him in. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I'm, I'm, but it's an example it, yeah. of a guy, of a defensive guy who's super cerebral, super thoughtful, um, led that LSU team defensively that was the best college football team yeah. I've ever seen. You know what I mean? Like they're so I but I agree for the most part. But then like you get boom motherfucker must champ and, and everybody was so excited about him. And then look what happened. Then Manny Diaz takes that same job at Texas and Look, and he's all fired up and throwing up fours and getting fifteen yard on sportsman likes and shit. And then how's that working out in Miami? So like, you know, I think it could, you know, I think I think situation yeah. has to fit right for for it to really work. I think Jeff will let him do that. But I think an interesting, I think an interesting name um, that could be a guy maybe that's looking for a job. Um, so if Billy Napier is a Tyrell well Muschamp. Hey man, there you go. There's one. Um, uh, Billy Napier. You're take t- take a thirty second timeout. Finish your sentence and take a thirty second timeout. That is not okay. No, this was a, <laughs> this was a comment. This was a comment. That's not me. I just read. Blame Eric. Should I put Eric in timeout for five minutes? Eric, the tribe has spoken. Five, you are on the <laughs> uh, But if if Billy Napier gets um, Billy Napier is a hot candidate for a variety of jobs. If he takes Florida or LSU. There is some thought, I've already seen it out there, that if he gets one of these jobs, 
they're going to not let him bring his staff with him. They're going to say, you need to hire a big time, what defensive coordinator, big time, whatever. Right. <clears throat> if they do yeah. that, Louisiana has a defensive coordinator named uh, Patrick Tony. I believe that's pretty good. Yes. He's off the Ron Roberts tree, I believe, who's the defense coordinator at Baylor right now. Um, he's really good. And so maybe it's a guy like that where um, he does not get taken along on the ride to Florida or LSU, and then he's a, he's suddenly available and he's really good. So maybe they're a guy like that could be available. I don't know. I, I don't think – do you guys think it's important this hire gets made quickly? I don't really think it is. Um. No, I, you've got I a think, lot of recruits in the in the barn already. It seems like yeah. that kind of knew what was going down. It, it seems. Sure. Is that your take on it, Nate? Yeah, I, I mean, it, I don't think Glenn was a key catalyst in any of these guys committing to to USF, and I don't think it'll change much because the playing time's still going to be there. I mean, the scheme's probably not going to change that much. You know, depending. Unless you like find a guy who just goes like nickel prowl and it's just like one down defensive lineman and ten guys standing up, like unless unless you go something just completely out of the box, these guys are gonna fit whatever scheme that Jeff Scott wants to bring in, right? And it's, it, I think Jeff Scott on this hire, he's got to put some forethought on. Okay, who's on my roster now? What can they actually do? So I, I wouldn't be too worried about recruits leaving after after today's announcement and i think you know you, you bring up um the pat tony from uh ull right yeah I, am i allowed to say i'm not allowed to say that right it's not louisiana. Technically they hate it, but it's louisiana they they, yeah. they want to be known as louisiana university of louisiana or louisiana because you'll get an email trust me you will get an email they're watching um, the stream there are there are two who really come after you and it's it's lala and it's our, our friends down the street and with a little bit of a uh usc not being called southern cal on the side you will get an email from an sid at some point but um <laughs> yeah those those are the three um so so, yeah, so I, pat, I pat tony's been pretty good at at uh, louisiana and his safeties coach is a former alabama great uh has experience coaching in florida has experience coaching in tampa has experience coaching on fowler Cobb's get excited uh, west excited. neighbors was west oh, neighbors could, okay could come back you know with with pack i mean uh, seems like west got a better job offer so you yeah know, if he brings i think west wanted west and billy i believe go go back a little bit and then Wes in in the the DC I believe also have some history so could be a package deal now you now you're solving your your safeties coach issue and uh, you just you know plug and play the the rest of the guys maybe I know I, I find it difficult for Ernie Sims who's been a, a pretty good recruiter and Daquan Bowers has been a good recruiter for the Bulls uh, on the defensive side of the ball to be let go I think that may cause a little bit more pause on the recruiting front so just kind of fix the head man, maybe get Pat Tony in here and then bring Wes into to coach safeties. Yeah, I mean you could you could the way the defense is split up, you could keep those guys and just make it a one defensive because what is Tony coach? I'm not sure what's his position group. Does he have one? Let me double check. I th I wanted to say it was linebackers. Let me double check. Because you could you could have two linebackers coaches instead of two defensive back. You could you could kind of you could make the that changes there in any way you want, but that's just, I threw his name out just because if he's a guy that kind of gets left behind, I mean, that's a really good candidate. I mean, that's the guy that uh, some people I talked to wanted Florida to hire when Mullen was still there as, as a, like one of the defensive coordinator uh, hires. So you may get a guy like that, that kind of comes loose in the coaching carousel and go snap him up. We shall see. Like, I, I think we are all, yeah. It's all just throwing darts right now. We're throwing darts. And where's Newberg when we need him? Like, he's, the, you know, or, or somebody else is, like, plugged into the assistant coaching community around here. Like, because I'm not, you know, I don't know any of that stuff. I, I'm better on the admin side. Yeah, and I, and I, I mean, we, we I'm sure we'll start working on something and talking about it and researching. But until we know kind of what he's looking for, it's really hard to narrow down 
you know, because if he doesn't want a guy with coordinator experience already, well, that opens the pool wide, you know, so for sure. Uh, well, I, I, I assume Jeff's going to want a defensive coordinator who will be multiple aggressive will blitz um, a real, a real players coach. A, do- so, a dog yeah. in recruiting. Yeah. Uh, just absolute a tireless dog recruiter. recruiter. Tireless recruiter. And to answer your question there, Seth, uh, Patrick Tony is responsible for outside linebackers as well. Well, there you go. Keep Sims for inside backers. He takes outside backers. One DB coach, you're good to go. Well, if you have outside backers, that means you're running a 3-4. Or in, two inside. If you have inside backers, I should say. You're He'd be a 3-4. I, don't I mean, know. if that's what they were. I mean, I mean, if all the linebackers came back, you're, who are your four linebackers? Andrew Mims. Mars Bellamy, and then Dwayne Boyles and Antonio Greer. I think it's uh, Andrew Mims and two guys you get in the portal. Maybe a heist, maybe a freshie. Like I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, turn- sh- like, man, we're turning be- over this roster, boys. It's Boyles should be a Boyles would be a great three four outside linebacker. It's what I thought they were going to make him when Spencer came in is a, more of a stand up and outside linebacker type. Which I thought he did pretty well the year, previous year as a pass rusher. That hey, man, Greer. Yeah, so I, I they've got some guys that can fit different things. Um, the depth obviously needs to, to be built on, but they're I mean they're getting after it in the portal and through the JUCO ranks. So I, I think they understand what needs to be done. Um, the concern was they didn't understand maybe what needed to be done at the coaching level, but we see that they. They understood quite well and, and made that change today. So, yeah, good job. And, yeah, and as uh, as we wrap up, as we've been talking for and rambling for an hour, um, just Vito cut half of this shit out. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the podcast listeners will get a, a much cleaner version of this. I'd assume um, it it was the right call. It was needed. Um, that's really. My final thought: I'm gonna have to figure out a new profile picture. That's that's the real downside my, to this. Mine's, I have the best one. I have the best one in America right now. Yeah, that was, that was pretty good. Yeah, it's hilarious. I mean, Toe from at Toe from here. He's also on a. Um, he's hilarious on TikTok too. Stand up comedian, USF grad, Eagles fan too, um, and a stand up comedian in uh, Seattle. And he's a diehard Bulls fan. And uh, yeah, go see my Twitter profile. It's it's hilarious. Also, um, you need to call uh, Melissa and Jay over at Irish Thirty One because I've been wearing an Irish Thirty One hat this entire podcast live on video. So make sure you get those extra. Um, uh, <laughs> look dollars. in the corner, Colin. I, I know. I see. I see the logo, but they're getting two logos now because like double, look, now they're getting double the logo. Double the logo. So uh, good job, Jay, giving me this hat many years ago. That is one of my favorite hats actually to wear. So, so. Um, yeah. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. I think we got a, a lot of live listeners. Appreciate you guys tuning in and hearing. You know our initial thoughts. We'll have a we'll have uh, we'll probably do the film room on Monday because I think Tuesday is probably going to be a pretty poignant uh, Illuminati podcast after uh, the coaching uh, shuffle and having hearing Jeff Scott speak to the media prior to Black Friday at Central Florida three thirty Eastern on ESPN two. If I'm not mistaken, maybe ESPN one of the two. I will be out there. Uh, Morgan will be out there taking photos for us. And then I've got to fly right back to get on my 5 a.m. flight to Vegas on Saturday morning. So fun and weekend. Sure, and, buddy, don't forget, you got to get Seth Tampa first, buddy, because I got some stuff for you before you head out there. Um, yeah. Uh, how's Tuesday look for you as we do this live on air? I will be home all week. I'm, I might be. I might be able to get to central. It's going to depend on work. Um, and I am actually going to get my booster tomorrow. So I'm taking Tuesday off because I feel, I know I'm going to feel like shit. So. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. I did schedule, I did schedule my booster because I, I haven't had a day off in probably about two months. And uh, yeah, I said, I, I might feel like shit on Tuesday. So I'm going to take that off. Smart move. Well, again, thanks for listening to this emergency edition of the Bluminati podcast, proudly presented by Irish 31. Make sure you guys head out there, have some drinks. Uh, Celebrate that there's a changing of the card, and USF did something about it before it was too late. And they're gonna, I truly believe Jeff Scott's gonna nail this defense coordinator higher. The Bulls are gonna go six and six next year, and they're gonna go to a bowl game. I agree. Uh, Nathan's thoughts, right, sub, 
disclaimer, Nathan, Nathan's thoughts are subject to change. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, hey, upon, also, upon seeing the hire. And, is, and is, by the way, while we're here, if we're going to start throwing flowers and throwing darts, um, hey, uh, Board of Trustees, don't let us go cheap on this hire. Find the money. Find you it. You want to win? Find the money. You got the money. Yeah, there's other projects you need to worry about. But if you're going to talk about stadiums and things like that, you need to invest in the program, not just in terms of facilities, not just in terms of what you've done, but you also need to make sure that what we have now is more sustainable. So, um, yeah, don't don't end up – don't force Jeff Scott's hand into making a hire that he doesn't want to make because he can't afford the guy that he wants. Step up, spend the cash. I Ask think they will. Willie how that happened. Oh. Ask Willie how he got stuck with uh, Breezy. Um because they said, "Well, you've never been a head. You've never been a head coach before. So we're going to give you defensive coordinator this experience. Um, it never works, man. Don't don't overplay your hand. Just and it's hard. Look, I understand this is a tough racket. It is tough to put together a staff. But like going on the cheap doesn't help. No. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Are you willing to do a go Bulls tonight? Yeah, go Bulls. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, absolutely. They did a great job. Go Bulls. Go, go Bulls. Bulls.